Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about the way that I like to program and train the deadlift for myself personally. And uh, this video will probably not go live until after Worlds, and I know I did a, a deadlift video the other day, you know, in the rotation, but I want to keep reiterating this, because I, I made this video the next morning after I did that 635 uh, stiff bar deadlift. So I'm making this the next morning and that footage is going to be in there. But you guys know that I like to use conjugate. Uh, I attribute the conjugate method to my deadlift. And what I like to do for a lot of my variations on the deadlift is, you know, you'll see me do stuff right there like a, that's a normal meat deadlift right there. Uh, 625 using a deadlift bar. You know, meat legal pull, nice good and hold at the lockout, set it back down under control. You'll also notice that I like to use for max effort, I like to use more difficult variations. And what does that mean? Well, use the stiff bar sometimes, right? Such as again, building up to a 635 stiff bar, which was an all out max shaking at the top. Uh, tools I like to use right there. Also like to do stiff bar off of deficits, which at the start of this video, you guys saw me do a 600 pound uh, one inch deficit deadlift so I'm standing on a one inch plate and using a stiff bar this makes it more difficult to break off the floor and it teaches you on your max work to push through the floor more and to use quads to break it off the floor which is what we have to do uh, in those cases it teaches you to use your leg drive but to use it from the optimal hip positions instead of trying to squat it up because we don't ever want to squat up a deadlift it is a hinge and that's a problem I've had with some of my lifters. You know, people go in the too farthest extremes. They either tend to fishing pull the lift by, uh, again, having the bar too far forward, just rounding their back completely, or they try to squat the weight up and then have no, they don't pull the slack out correctly. They drop too low, the arms bend a little, and then they try to just stand straight up with it on a conventional. Well, that doesn't work. Uh, but the more difficult variations force us to use a slightly lighter weight, but still pull very, very hard on our, our max effort lifts. Okay. And again, here's the example right there. This was the 635, which was a PR, and I did it with the stiff bar. And I get a lot of power off the floor, but you guys can tell that shaking as I get up near the top. In fact, in that case, my grip is starting to give out a little bit, which you know means that uh, I need more grip work. But that can be handled by doing uh, axle bar work. Remember guys, your rows and your lat work do contribute to your deadlifts. And, uh, and they oftentimes should make up a large chunk of your grip training. Uh, as far as the other tools I really like to use, uh, obviously the reverse hyper and speed pulls. I believe outside of max effort variations and using more difficult variations. And remember those variations can be based upon your weak points. Right? They can be based upon your weak points. And right now for me, I feel like the lockout is a bit more of a weak point. So I like to use uh, things like deficits and things. But the reverse hyperextension. All right, why do I love it? Well, because it replicates a deadlift. It uses all the muscles of the deadlift, including your grip, once you get really strong at it. And I use very, very heavy weights on it. Right, as you guys notice right there, and I try to control the swinging the best that I can, but it gets becomes impossible once the weight gets heavier and heavier. It's, it's the, the device is on roller bearings. Okay, it's going to have inertia, but the centric overload from that is phenomenal. Uh, and if anything, I find that the reverse hyper really allows you to control the centrics really well on the deadlift when you go to set it down at a meet because they want it under control. They do want it under control, but you have the eccentric loading there and the eccentric overload from that device. I do feel like causes a very large hypertrophic response in all the muscles of the deadlift because the hinge pattern is the same. So for the lower back, the glutes, the hamstrings, uh, again, we're getting eccentric based hypertrophy. You also have the restorative effect of it meaning it pulls on the spine. Well, we get massive amounts of axial loading on the deadlift, which has its own recovery component. And some of the issues with axial loading, a lot of, a lot of people believe this, and I fall in that camp, that putting the spine into traction can help with recovery from axial loading. 
So it helps us as a recovery tool and a restoration tool for the deadlift. You know, in addition to building, uh, you know, a lot of those muscles involved, well, really all the primary movers. You know, everything but the quads, which we use to break it off the floor. But again, that recovery component, and then even the grip component, once you start getting real strong on reverse hypers, you kind of have to chalk your hands up even, right, just to hold on to those handles, right? It is, is a very powerful grip training tool as well. Uh, I also like to utilize speed pulls. And I love to utilize speed pulls. I prefer them against bands due to setup reasons and the fact that bands really, really impact your grip. So when you get good with bands, it helps with the lockout tremendously, right? It helps the lockout because you were fighting the lockout with heavy bands on speed work. But also one of the things that people notice, like when I put this clip up that you're seeing there again, everyone's like, oh man, that wasn't a wonder at max. That wasn't RPE 10. Like you're claiming it was so fast, but notice the leg shake. Like that is everything that I have. That leg shake might even cause me to get red lighted and comp. Okay, that's a serious deal. But because I do all those speed pulls and particularly against bands and chains, uh, those speed pulls help you with acceleration. They help you with speed strength, right? And again, people can argue about, well, the, the deadlift can be ground really slow. Well, it can. But for people like me who, who tend to be a little faster, those speed pulls let me capitalize on that. Right? And if I can blast through my sticking points, I'll be able to lock it out. Okay, and so by us running bands, and my sticking point tends to be right below the knee. And at that point, the bands are kicking in really hard on the speed pulls, and we're doing multiple reps, you know, and sets setting up for it. It teaches us to accelerate through those sticking points. We also have the added benefit of when we use bands on it, the grip training at the top, especially if you hold for a moment, the grip training is phenomenal. Then we have the centric overload component, because when you go to reverse it against bands, you pull against bands, you get an overspeed eccentric as soon as you go to lower it that you then fight against, okay? Uh, again, people want to talk about eccentric reps. You'll hear bodybuilders talk about eccentric stuff, and then they don't perform eccentrics in a way that's actually uh, stimulates. They think it's going real slow, but that's not the case. In this case, we're creating true eccentric overload, right? We're creating with the heavy weight from the inertia on the reverse hyper, and we get the same thing on the speed pulls, particularly against bands. There can be a very large hypertrophic response, uh, and again, also, it seems to really hammer the traps and the grip harder than a lot of other modalities. So I'm a real big fan of using uh, speed pulls and particularly against bands to build my own deadlift. All right, so this is the methods that I use personally uh, and that I prefer to do. All right, guys, but well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I'll talk to you guys next time.